don't know why that moved up for here. But that is uh, being strange. Oh, where did my chat go? Okay, um, so let's start with questions. Um, so I think last time we had met, um, we had taken questions from homework five and six. That's what I checked over the weekend. Um, and we had just kind of written that quadratic program on our calculator, and we didn't really get a new assignment last time. But if anybody still has anything that's kind of... Um, you know, still kind of that they're wondering about whether it's specific, like number seven from homework six, or if it's kind of general, like, uh, how do I know when to do what? Um, we can start by kind of addressing those before we kind of get into new stuff. And if you have a specific thing, you could type that into the chat as a specific question. Um, and if you have something that's general, you know, that's something that, like, probably is better just unmuting and we can have a conversation about it. Um, and I'll probably write some stuff in response to that in addition to talking about it, but um, those kind of sorts of questions are probably better verbal than written. Mr. Kula? Yes. What is the uh, reverse order of operations? Okay. So when I say, when we talk about the order of operations, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, and when we're simplifying an expression, we go, first we do stuff in parentheses, and then we do the exponents, and then multiplication, and division, and then addition and subtraction, right? When we're going to solve, we're kind of undoing simplification, so we're going in the reverse order. So the first thing we try to do is undo addition and subtraction, and then we undo multiplication and division, undo any exponents, and then undo anything in a parenthesis. So for example, if we had like um, something like this, oops, so this is a quadratic that we would be asking to solve, right? This is one that I would use the reverse order of operations to do. So the first thing I'd want to do is undo any addition and subtraction. Well, I see a minus 10, and I see a plus 6. But the plus 6 is inside a set of parentheses, so I can't get at that until I've kind of cleared out everything around the parentheses. So I'm just going to ignore the plus 6 there. And we'll just start by adding 10 to both sides, undoing that subtraction. And then we'd look to undo any multiplication or division. So I see a times 2, so I can divide both sides by 2, and that gets rid of the multiplication. And there's no division going on. Um, so the next thing I'd go to is exponents to get rid of this squared. We'll square root both sides. And the square cancels the square root. And when we square root both sides of an equation, we get a plus or minus. And then the square root of 8, we can do a little bit better then, because I know 8 is 4 times 2 root of 8 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. So it's really just 2 root 2. And then lastly, we can get rid of that 6 now that the parentheses are out of there by subtracting 6 from both sides. And I can't combine something not in a radical with something that's in a radical. So this is as good as I could do. So the reverse order of operations is just like your normal kind of solving algorithm that we've been using. Now it's a little bit more complicated because we have more operations going on in this than like we did when we were just solving something like 5x plus 8 is equal to 10. 
but it's still kind of the same basic idea. Sydney, did I answer your question there? Yeah. Okay. Maybe more than you even needed, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. Why won't you distribute the two? Why won't you distribute the two to the to the x plus six in the parentheses? In uh, the parentheses? Because you'd be violating the order of operations. So you're talking about now doing simplification and you're doing multiplication before you've done an exponent. Okay. Right? So like if yeah. I did, I don't remember what it was. You were talking about trying to do that. You can't, yeah. you can't do that until you've done the squaring. Right, so you, okay. really what you would need to do okay. is this, and then you could distribute the two into one of the two, and then FOIL, or you could FOIL and then distribute the two through the result, but you can't do what you were describing there, because that's equivalent to distributing the two into both sets of parentheses. So you'd end up with okay. the wrong answer. Does that Did that help? Yeah, okay, thank you. Of course, of course. Okay, um, so starting new stuff today. So at this point, just to kind of summarize, we've talked about simplification. We've talked about solving. There's two more skills still to talk about inside of this chapter. We need to talk about graphing and modeling, both of which are gonna be much less involved than simplifying or solving. So these last two section or last two topics are much more straightforward. There's a lot less to do, um, and should go relatively quickly. So maybe a day or two for the, each of those two topics at most. Um, so we'll we'll finish up here this chapter. You know, not this week. Well, maybe this week, but like I'd still take another day the week after then to kind of touch base before we tried to do a test or anything. Um, since you're going to be gone all next week, it doesn't seem hardly fair to first day you come back like, oh, it's test time. Like, that's that's rude. Um, my apologies to anybody that's any of your other teachers that are actually doing that. I would I will not. Anyways, uh, so let's start about talking about graphing. So the graph of a quadratic is called a parabola. And what it looks like is like this U shape that either opens up or opens down and we can tell um, whether it opens up or opens down really easily from looking at the equation so if the a value is positive the parabola will open up if the a value is negative it'll open down um, when I refer to the A, I'm talking about the A value, whether we're in standard form, vertex form, or intercept form, it makes no difference. We're talking about that same A value. So that's really easy, right? You just look at whether the A is per negative and you immediately know if the graph would be opening up or opening down. Um, it's worth noting that there are quadratics that open left and right, but those are not functions and they're not something that we would deal with in this class. Um, but they'd have like a Y squared and just a single X for something like that that would open left or right. But those aren't functions, and this class is about functions, so we're going to ignore those sort of situations. Let's 
So some key features. Um, so there's four of them that we're going to be interested in. So let's say we have a parabola that looks like this. Oops, let's use a different color. So this point is called the vertex. The vertex is just the highest or lowest point on your parabola. So if your parabola opens up, the vertex is basically the bottom of that valley, like you can see here. And if your parabola opened down, it would be like the top of the hill. Um, another of parabolas is that they are symmetric. By that I mean there's a line that we can draw that divides the parabola into two like mere halves. We call that line the axis of symmetry. And that's just like this in imaginary vertical line that kind of divides the parabola into these two mere halves. So the next feature we're going to talk about is the x-intercepts, which is just where the graph crosses the x-axis. And the last key feature is the y-intercept. And that's just where the graph crosses the y-axis. Now, it's worth mentioning here the x-intercepts don't always exist, right? So if you imagine we have a parabola that opens up whose vertex is above the x-axis already, if it's opening up, it's never going to cross the x-axis. So there can be parabolas that have no x-intercepts. The y-intercept, however, always will exist you'll always have a y-intercept, regardless of whether the parabola is opening up or down. Now, I won't ever need you to define, like write out in words the definitions for these things, so I'm not gonna give formal definitions for any of these. Um, really, the most I would ever expect is that you're able to like identify them by sight, like we've done here. Um, so I, I wouldn't need anything more than that. The uh, next we're going to talk about algebraically. So if you have the graph already, it's easy enough to look at the graph and figure and read off the x, y axis, like what these values are, right? Like if you draw a point on a graph, you can estimate its coordinates. That's not hard. Um, but if you're given just the equation, it would be nice to be able to identify these features without having to create the entire graph and then like locate the point on the graph and then estimate the x x and y coordinate for that point like could we just get it all from the function without actually having to draw the picture so that's what we're going to be doing here and i'm going to go from my the bottom of my list up so we're going to start with the y-intercept
So just like for a linear function, to find the y-intercept here, we're just going to plug 0 in for x and simplify. So for example, we have something like 2x squared minus 8x plus 3. Well, I can observe that this is standard form. Really, but I'll just, since we've been taught, so my y-intercept is the point 0, 3. The x-coordinate is 0 because that's what we plugged in for x. And the y-coordinate is 3 because when I plug 0 in for x, I get y equals 3. I can do the same thing whether we're in vertex form. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 squared is 9. 9 times negative 2 is negative 18. Minus 10 is negative 28. So there is 0, negative 28. Or if we're in, it doesn't matter. We're still doing the same thing, plugging 0 in for x. So 0 plus 3 is 3. 0 minus 4 is negative 4. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. So here we have 0, negative 12. So that should be um, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to handle. Are there any questions about the y-intercept? Okay. On to the x-intercept. To find the x-intercept, So just a couple of examples. So here we can observe that we have a standard form. So I'll start by plugging 0 in for x. And this becomes a problem like we've been working on for solving. So we have a standard form polynomial or a quadratic equal to 0. So to solve this, I can either use factoring or the quadratic formula. Since the leading coefficient is 1, this could be factorable. And if it is factorable, I could use the shortcut on it. So I'm going to check that first. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me 12 and add to give me 8. Those two numbers are 6 and 2. So I can factor it. And then when I apply the zero product property, I can set each of these factors equal to zero and solve. So this gives me two points, the points negative six, zero and negative two, zero. Again, the x value gives me my x coordinate and the value that I plugged in for y gives me my y coordinate. So let's take a look at this one. Here we have a problem in vertex form. So again, doesn't matter what form it's in. I'm going to start by plugging 0 in for y. I didn't want to use a 7 here, though. Let's pick a more convenient number, um, 8. Okay. Um, so since this is in vertex form, I can solve this using the reverse order of operation. So I'll add 8 over, and then divide by 2. Then we'll square root both sides. Because we're square rooting both sides, that creates a plus or minus. And the square root cancels the squared. And then I can subtract the 1 over, and they can split this into two pieces. So I have negative 1 plus 2 is equal to x, 1 minus 2 is equal to x. So I have x equals 1, and x equals negative 3. 
So that gives me the point one zero and negative three zero. Again, just like what we've been doing in the homework, right? It just basically turned into a solving problem. One more situation to deal with. Wait, Mr. Cool, like if you mind if you were if you had to like minus the eight, wouldn't it make oh wait, no, never mind. I'm wrong, sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I don't mind you interrupting if you had a question. It sounded like you sorted it out for yourself, though, which are the best kinds of questions, right? Where it's like, oh, yeah, now I get it. I just had to start talking aloud, and then it clicked, which is a nice feeling. Um, the last situation, I'll note that this is an intercept form equation. And I notice what I have is something I can immediately apply the zero product property to. So I can take each of these three. Now, negative 5 equals 0, that's a bunch of nonsense. That gives me no solution from that part. But I can solve the other two by adding 3 to both sides and then subtracting 4 from both sides, respectively. So this doesn't give, cause an x-intercept, but 0 is an x-intercept, and then negative 4 is What would it have looked like on one of these situations if I got no x-intercepts? How would I know that I got no x-intercepts? We mentioned that that was possible to happen. What might have that looked like? Well, in any of these situations, if my answers to my solving problem included an imaginary piece, that would indicate to me that there is no x-intercept, since we can't plot a coordinate that has an imaginary part on the x-y-axis, because the x-y-axis doesn't have any space for imaginary numbers in it. So if you got an imaginary part on your solution for x, that would indicate to you that there are no x-intercepts. Next up is the axis of symmetry. So the axis of symmetry uh, can be found with a formula. So for standard form, that formula is x equals negative b over 2a. For vertex form, it's x equals h. Form, it's x equals p plus q over 2. Again, remember, standard form is ax squared plus bx plus c. Vertex form is a. And intercept form is y equals a times x minus p times x minus q. Just as a reminder, I'm sure you remembered those, but if you didn't, the letters in the formulas don't make a whole lot of sense, right? So let's roll through a couple of examples. So again, uh, I observe first that I'm in standard form. So since I'm in standard form, I'm going to use the standard form equation, x equals negative b over 2a. My value for b is negative 8. My value for a is 2. So I just get x equals 2. Now remember that this is actually the equation for a vertical line. Not just a value for x. This is an equation for a line. It just happens to be a vertical line, so it starts x equals instead of y equals. But it's an equation for a line. Keep that in mind. That's something you could plot if you wanted to. It's not just like a number. Oops. Okay. Another example. Here I, we observe that we have something in vertex form. 
So vertex form, I remember that h is just the opposite of whatever this value is. So in our case, h is negative 3, and we're done. Nothing really to do there. All we had to do was figure out the h value from looking at the form of the equation. And the last situation um, we have x plus 3, or negative of x plus 3 times x minus 5. This is, we observe, is intercept form. So we're going to use x equals p plus q over 2. I remember that p is the opposite of whatever this one is, so negative 3. And q is the opposite of the second parenthesis, so that's going to be 5. So that's negative 3 plus 5 over 2. That's 2 over 2, or just 1. So we have x equals 1. So again, this is pretty easy, right? All we're doing is just using some formulas and plugging the numbers in for the formulas. Not super difficult. The form, none of the formulas are terribly complex, right? They're all pretty straightforward. Just have a couple of values in them. They should be relatively easy to handle. Um, the biggest place where students make mistake is just goofing up the signs on their H's and P's and Q's. You just have to remember that they're the opposite signs. The last key feature we should talk about is the vertex. So the vertex is a point, right? It's got an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. So to find the x-coordinate, I'll call that vx, so the vertex is x-coordinate. It's just going to be the same as the axis of symmetry. So I can use those formulas from the axis of symmetry to find the x-coordinate. The y-coordinate I can find just by plugging that x-coordinate in to my function and then simplify. Maybe I should... I thought it was kind of implied that we'd be plugging that in for x, but maybe I say that explicitly. So the first step in finding a vertex, I have to find the axis of symmetry anyways. So I'm just going to use the previous, I'm just going to continue the previous examples for axis of symmetry. Some more, I'm going to continue the work for those problems in blue. So I'm just going to go back to those previous three examples we did for the axis of symmetry and kind of continue those problems in blue. So the x-coordinate for my vertex is just 2. And then my y-coordinate, I'm just going to plug 2 in for x and simplify. So 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 2 times 8 is 16. 8 minus 16 is negative 8. And then plus 3 is negative 5. So my vertex then is 2 comma negative 5. If I look at my next example, here my x-coordinate for my vertex is negative 3. To find the y-coordinate, I'll just plug negative 3 in for x. So negative 3 plus 3 is 0. 0 squared is 0. 0 times negative 2 is 0, 0 minus 7 is negative 7, so this is 3 comma negative 7 for my vertex. Worth noting here, 
What do you notice that's special about negative seven? It's also the k value. So for vertex form, the vertex is always just h comma k. Now you can do the steps that we've done, but that's a little shortcut where we can just get the vertex on site because it's easy to pick out the values for h and k in a vertex form equation. That's why we call it vertex form FYI is because you can literally read the vertex right out of the problem. You don't have to do any calculation at all, which is nice, right? Okay, and then our last one. So again, the x-coordinate of the vertex is the same as the axis of symmetry. And then I just plug in that into my function. So, um, oops, copied that down wrong. That's a three. Uh, one plus three is four. One minus five is negative four. Uh, negative four times negative four is positive 16. So my vertex is one comma 16. Any questions on how I did any of these things? Okay, excellent. And in reality, these are the hardest things that you'd have to do for graphing. To actually generate the graph is no more difficult than any of this, which is lovely. So to draw the graph of a quadratic, we need the vertex and then two points on either side of the vertex. And that's going to be enough. So let's just do an example. So to get the x coordinate for the vertex, we're going to recognize this as standard form. So I can use the standard form equation to find the axis of symmetry. So negative b over 2a, plug 8 in for b and 1 in for a, and I get negative 4. To find the y-coordinate of the vertex then, I just plug negative 4 in for x, negative 4 squared is 16, 8 times negative 4 is negative 32, 16 minus 32 is negative 16, minus 3 is negative 19. I make an xy table, and I'm going to make mine horizontally. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I know that the vertex needs to go in the middle of it. And it's just a little bit easier to kind of draw that horizontally, for me anyways. If you want to draw yours vertically, you knock your socks off. Do whatever you want. Okay, so there's my vertex. It's in the middle of the table because I need two points on either side of the vertex. And any two points on either side of the vertex will be fine. So how do I ensure that I'm going to find a point on the other side? Well, I'm going to pick two x values that are less than the x coordinate for my vertex. So maybe I'll pick negative 5 and negative 6. No reason to be you know, make that any harder than it needs to. Let's just pick the next numbers in line. And then I need two numbers that are greater than the x-coordinate for my vertex. So well, let's just do negative 3 and negative 2. It doesn't really matter what those numbers are, but the closer you pick your values to the vertex, usually the better things work out. You can get some pretty absurdly big or small numbers if you pick something pretty far away from the vertex. 
So now to find the corresponding y coordinates, I can just go ahead and plug these into my function. So negative 6 squared is 36. 8 times negative 6 is negative 48. 36 minus 48 is negative 12. Minus 3 more is negative 15. And we'll plug negative 5 in. Again, what we're plugging into is the original problem, right? So negative 5 squared is 25. 8 times negative 5 is negative 40. 25 minus 40 is uh, 15, and fi or negative 15, excuse me. And negative 15 minus 3 is negative 18. And keep going. Do the same thing for negative 3. Oops. And I get negative 18. If I do the same thing for negative 2, I get negative 15. Now, before we plot this, which would be the next step, you might be wondering something if you look at the pattern of the y coordinates on our table. You might have noticed that these pairs of y coordinates are the same. And you might be wondering to yourself, does that always happen? Can I just do like one half of the table and then fill in the other half with my answers from the first half, right? Could I do that every time? Yeah, it's possible that you can do that every time, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen every time. The way that we can make it happen is or one unit, and the distance from negative 4 to negative 3 is also one unit, since those are the same distance from the vertex. Their, x, their y coordinate should be the same. Similarly, If we look at the next set of points, negative 6 is 2 units from the vertex, and negative 2 is also 2 units from the vertex, so their y coordinate should be the same. In general, you'll probably, it'll probably be very easy to choose your x coordinate so that this happens, so you don't have to do this. Um, a situation where it becomes inconvenient to do this. Well, imagine if the x-coordinate for the vertex is two-thirds. If you do that, if that happens to pick the um, pick the x-coordinate so they're all the same distance apart, basically means all your x-coordinates are going to have to be fractions now. And that's probably more of an inconvenience to deal with rather than just like picking whole numbers and plugging whole numbers in four times, I'd probably rather do that than have to deal with like grinding through plugging in fractions two times. Um, but that's a personal preference thing. It'll certainly be easier to graph whole numbers than it would fractions also. You know, if your coordinates have fractions in it, it's kind of ambiguous how to graph some of those things. Anyways, though, we still need to draw our picture here, so let's do that. Make myself some space. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm gonna go by two since these numbers are quite small. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. Okay, so negative six, negative fifteen. like right about there and then negative 5 right about there and negative 4 negative 19 is like right there and I'm there and then I'm like there so it should be curvy when you draw your parabola don't draw it so that it looks like a V should be curvy like that. So there's my parabola. Any questions on how I did any of that? Okay. Um, again, if you're doing 
if the if the problem was vertex form or intercept form it's still basically the same thing you find the vertex using the appropriate formula and then you pick points on either side you know two points on either side and you just plug in those x coordinates back into the original function to find the y coordinates and you plot your points regardless of the form it doesn't change anything um, the last topic that we need to talk about in regards to graphing is domain and range. And this will be brief because domain is always negative infinity to positive infinity. Every single time for all quadratic functions, that is the case. Oh, that's nice. You know, whenever the domain is just like always the same thing, that makes life easier. The range has two situations, depending on the parabola opens up or whether it opens down. So if it opens up, we go from the y coordinate and the vertex to positive infinity. Note that the y coordinate and the vertex there has a bracket, not a parenthesis. And if the parabola opens down up to the y coordinate and the vertex, which again, Note that that has a bracket and not a parenthesis. So if we go back to our previous problem, we can identify its domain and range quite easily. So the domain, just negative infinity to positive infinity because it's a quadratic. The range, well, I know this parabola opened up right from the beginning because its leading coefficient is positive, but my picture is also showing it opening up, so I know that I'm using this formula for the range. So my y-coordinate for my vertex is negative 19. I don't know where I got 23 from. Thinking of Michael Jordan or something. And then that'll go up to positive infinity. Okay with that. Um, any questions about anything that we've done up into this point? Okay. Well, this is where I want to stop for today. Um, in general, I'm going to try my darndest not to ever have to do an 80 minute Zoom call because I have to imagine that's excruciating on your end um and i don't really want to have to do that you know and i think that by for the most part um what we're doing right now is things that i can condense into 30 or 40 minutes topping really 60 is as long as i'd really want to go on a zoom call with you guys i think it's not very reasonable to expect you guys to sit there for 80 minutes and just listen to me talk um so this is where we'll stop. Um, the homeworks, I've put two of them into one note here, or um, yeah, one note to look at. Um, homework seven is just some more solving practice. So it's just 10 solving problems. Um, I, the directions indicate that you have to show work. So you can use your quadratic program to solve some of these, but really should only be using it as a checker um, once you've solved it by hand. Certainly you can use the quadratic formula, just show me what you're plugging in to the formula at minimum before you list the answers. And then homework eight is covering stuff that we did today. So the first five problems, I just want you to indicate whether the parabola opens up or down, what its axis of symmetry is, and then what its vertex is. It should be pretty easy, right? And then the last three problems, I want you to draw the graphs. So you need to write out your five point xy table with the vertex as the middle point and draw your, you know, plot your points and draw it and draw your graph. So it should be should be a pretty easy homework eight. Um, I think that this topic of graphing these quadratics should be should be relatively easy for you guys. Um, and that's it for today. So 